the book of Romans chapter 5 Romans 5 verse 1 to chapter 6 verse 16 and Lord we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study in Jesus name Amen Romans 5 verse 1 therefore since we are justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ there is no peace between sinners and God until that sinner has received Christ as Lord and Savior Jesus bridges the gap between holy God and sinful man God is angry at sinners the Bible says he is angry at sinners every day but Jesus removes that anger on behalf of Christians verse 2 through him that is Jesus we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God our faith gives us access to God our faith gives us a right relationship with God a safe relationship with God and it is our faith working through God's grace that does that for us because God is the one who made it all happen it was God's grace that planned the cross which would pay for our sins it was God's grace that you were even interested in Christ and were drawn to Christ in order to receive forgiveness if you're a Christian 3 more than that we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance now God saves us by grace and then he starts working in us to make us more like his children should be and the process he uses often involves suffering suffering produces patience if we draw close to God as we should when we suffer but it doesn't stop there notice verse 4 and endurance or, or patience produces character and character produces hope and so problems produce patience patience leads to strong character strong character helps us to trust God and then as we are trusting God through difficult times our faith in him grows stronger see there's no easy fix there's no quick fix to faith there's no easy road to faith it involves suffering and it involves the word of God verse 5 and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us strong faith does not come easy but when you get it you are able to handle things that would destroy others strong faith enables us to know deep down that all is well even when things are not too well on the surface strong faith helps you to know that God loves you and you know it because your relationship with the Holy Spirit who lives in you is strong that's what happens when you allow problems to draw you closer to God and not push you away from him six <clears throat> while we were yet helpless at the right time Christ died for the ungodly mankind was in a helpless situation there was no way to escape the power of sin or the penalty of sin which is hell but that's when Jesus stepped in he came to our rescue Jesus died for people who by their own choice were God's enemies Jesus died for those who had willfully turned their backs on God which is all of us seven why one will hardly die for a righteous man though perhaps for a good man 
one will dare even to die. Most people would not die, even for someone who is good. Some might, but God says most would not. Which makes what Jesus did for sinners even more impressive. Verse 8 But God shows His love for us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God allowed His Son to die for the human race, which had willfully rebelled against Him. Boy, I never doubt God's love for you, because He could not show it any better than He has. Suffering and dying for sinners, who had rebelled against Him by doing things He hates, love doesn't get any stronger than what Jesus did. Verse 9 Since, therefore, we are now justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God, that makes sense. Since Jesus made guilty sinners right with God by his death, he certainly will save those same people who have now been declared not guilty. He will save them from the eternal wrath of God. Listen, if Jesus died for us when we were guilty, he's certainly going to save us from the wrath of God now that we have been declared righteous. If he was nice to us when we were guilty, guilty in our sin he sure will be nice to us now that we have been declared not guilty by his grace verse 10 for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life Jesus saved us when we were God's enemies he saved us by dying for us if he did that for his enemies then he will certainly do what is best for us now that we are at peace with him we have a living Savior who is in heaven praying for us and helping us 11 not only so but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received our reconciliation Christians rejoice with God we rejoice in God the Bible says if you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ you're glad about it knowing that Jesus died and paid for your sins so that you don't have to go to hell and that you can have a right relationship with your creator that's a big deal and it makes us feel good 12 therefore as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all men sinned when Adam sinned sin came into the entire human race sin spread to everyone this is talking about original sin original sin trans original sin transferred to every one of us and resulted in death for every one of us Every human being is guilty because they are connected to Adam. Then what we have to do is get connected to Christ and reverse that. And that's what the rest of this chapter is about. Look at verse 13. Sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Now, think about this. In the years from Adam to Moses, who received God's law, People did bad things during all those years. They sinned. They did not act like God. But technically, they did not break God's law. They could not break God's law because He did not give the commandments and the rest of His law until the time of Moses. So look at verse 14 now. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam. Now we can understand why Adam sinned. God gave Adam a specific command. Adam sinned by disobeying a specific command. Do not eat that fruit. Remember God said, Don't eat that fruit, Adam. And the day you eat it, you will die. So he ate it and he died. We can understand that. 
people from Adam to Moses did not disobey a specific command like Adam did. They had no specific commands to break. But they still died. Why? Answer, original sin. It spread through the whole human race and it made us all guilty. Look at 14 again. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Adam, who got us into this sinful mess, was a picture of Jesus who died on the cross to reverse what Adam did and get us out of this mess. Verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift and the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Adam brought death to many with his sin. Original sin spread and resulted in death. Jesus brought forgiveness to many through the grace and mercy of God. Jesus undid for his people what Adam did to all people. Verse 16. And the free gift is not like the effect of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. Well, what a contrast we see between Adam and Christ. Adam's sin spread to many and killed many. Meanwhile, Jesus takes away the sins of many and gives the many eternal life. 17. If because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ. Original sin brought death to the human race. Death ruled. It was on the throne. Death had its way because everyone dies. But Jesus reverses death for his people. Where there was physical death, there is now physical resurrection for Christians. Where there was eternal hell, there is now a new heaven and a new earth to look forward to if you are a Christian. 18. Then, as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. Original sin makes a person guilty even before we commit one actual sin of our own. It makes us guilty and it makes us deserving of punishment. But Jesus' holiness and his perfect sinlessness plus his cross removes original sin and all actual sin from his people. And so by doing that it removes the need for punishment and replaces it instead with eternal life. And so you see, Jesus gets his people out of the trouble that Adam got them into. 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Jesus was not conceived by some son of Adam like we were. We're all sons of Adam. Not Jesus. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Creed. The Apostles' Creed. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He wasn't a son of Adam. Jesus is God's son. He was not born with original sin like the rest of us because he didn't inherit it from Adam. And not only that, Jesus never sinned on his own. So, we all share in the guilt of Adam because we are all a part of Adam but those of us who receive Christ are also holy to God just as Jesus is holy to God we shift heads from Christ or from Adam to Christ when we receive Jesus verse 20 the law came in to increase the trespass stop there not that God gave 
the commandments so that we would sin more. That's not what this is talking about. Rather, he gave us his commandments so that we would understand what kind of big spiritual failures we really are. Our awareness of our sin increased after God gave us his law. Last part of verse 20. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The clearer we see our sinfulness, the more we appreciate God's grace in forgiving us through Christ. No one appreciates the grace of God more than the one who knows what kind of sinner they really are. And here's the really good news. God's grace can clean the soul of even the worst sinner. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. 21. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's grace knocked sin off its throne. Sin can no longer enslave people. Sin can no longer send them to hell if they don't let it. God's kindness through Jesus Christ makes us right with God and gives us eternal life. Receive Jesus and His righteousness scrubs the sin off of our soul and makes us spiritually clean to God. Chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Someone says, well, since God's grace is magnified by our sin, let's just keep sinning so God can show us more kindness by forgiving those sins. Since God loves to forgive, let's do Him a favor and sin. What kind of reasoning is that? Look at verse 2. By no means. How can we who died to sin live in it? No way, says Paul. Why would we keep sinning when we do not have to keep sinning? Christians do not have to sin. Christ has given us the power to say no. And a real Christian deep down wants to say no. Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? When we became Christians and were baptized, we became part of Christ. This is talking about water baptism. We were placed in Jesus. When that happened, the power of our sin nature to enslave us without our permission was broken. I'm sorry if that doesn't fit somebody's systematic theology, but that's what this verse is saying. And it continues in verse 4. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. When we, were, when we are under the water of baptism, I don't care if it's sprinkled or poured or dipped. When we were under the water of baptism, we were buried with Jesus. When we come up from under the water, we are raised with Jesus. Meaning this, our sin nature's ability to control us was dead and buried. The resurrection life of Christ that is in us as Christians as Christians, enables us to live like Jesus. 5. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Remember, being a Christian means to be united to Christ. That's what it means. To be united to Christ. And so, we are united with Jesus in His death. We share with Jesus in His death. Which for us means our sin nature is dead. It cannot control us. It cannot enslave us unless we allow it. And being united with Christ, sharing with Christ, means we will also share in His resurrection. In other words, we're going to rise just like Jesus did. Let's move on. Verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. See, there it is. The old self, the part of us that loves sin, has been killed in Christ. Our bodies may still want to sin, but we are free not to sin now that we are in Christ. In Christ, 
there is deliverance from sin. In Christ, there is deliverance from sinful habits. 7. For he who has died is freed from sin. When we die, sin isn't an issue with us anymore. After we die physically, there is no attraction to sin anymore. What kind of temptation is somebody going to dangle in front of you after you're physically dead? Let them try. It's not going to move you. When we died with Christ, we were set free from sin's control. We still have our sin-loving bodies, but deep down inside, Christians do not want to sin anymore. Verse 8. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. To live with Christ means two things here. It refers to the ability to live like Christ, and therefore to live with Christ means to enjoy His fellowship today. But it also means we're going to be raised from the dead like He was. 9. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. You cannot die physically twice. Jesus died once. He was raised. He cannot die again. Death only has one bullet for each one of us. It has no control over us after it kills us the first time. You say, well, that's enough, isn't it? No. Because we're going to be raised. If we're Christians, we're coming back in these bodies. And once we are brought back to life, we're going to stay living. Because death can't kill us twice. We're going to go on living forever. Twelve. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. When Jesus died, it was to destroy sin. He destroyed sin's power to control his people, and he destroyed the penalty of sin for his people, which is hell. And now, after his work on the cross was finished, Jesus lives in fellowship with God. Perfect fellowship, everlasting fellowship with the Father. Verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We cannot apply something unless we first know it. That's why God says, consider yourself dead to sin. God says, your sin nature's power to pull your strings and make you do what you do not want to do is dead. Remember that. And remember also that you are able to live for God. Knowing Knowing that you can be holy through Christ is the first step to holiness. 12. Do not let sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not let sin reign in your body. Don't let sin influence what you do in your body. Don't even think about how it might want to use your body. Don't even think about it. Sin is a spiritual parasite to the Christian. Don't allow it to use your body. It has no right. 13. Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Do not serve evil by allowing it to use your body to sin. Serve God by allowing Him to use your body as a tool for doing what is good. God commands us to let Him use us as tools to do good. 14. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Sin doesn't, doesn't have to control us. Not as Christians. We are free. We are under grace. We have the grace to do what is right. God has given us the spiritual fuel needed to do what is right and avoid what is wrong. We are under grace. 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Someone says, well, since our salvation does not come from keeping God's law but from God's grace, from His kindness, I guess we can just sin like crazy and not even give it a second thought, right? 
wrong, says Paul. God's grace is not a license to sin. It is the freedom not to sin. 16. Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. We choose our master. We can choose to serve sin, which leads to death, including eternal death, or we can serve God, which leads to righteousness. Whichever master we choose, and the choice is ours, whichever master we choose will gladly rule over us.